bless God. We thank you for the anointing over it. Spread it, Father, everywhere, Father, for your kingdom, God. We love and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go, Father, I thank you that today I will have an encounter with you and be equipped through your word to have the boldness to engage others. You may be seated. It's really funny because, you know, when I get up there and made the announcement about the tithing challenge, and, and I don't know how I said it, but the Lord cor quickly corrected me and made, me, made sure that you realize this is not something that we just dreamed up, but the board, come on, and the elders and everybody is back in this 100%. So it's not just me challenging you or Pastor Kempe or Pastor Datha. It's the leadership of the C Church. Amen. Because we so believe in it. And I know that God's got amazing things in store for you and your family. And I want you in a position to get all that God has. Amen. So I'm excited. We're going to continue the series on Psalms chapter 2. And this morning I woke up and I was amazing that we're singing that song that we exalt you, Lord. Oh, Father, we exalt you, we exalt you, we exalt you. Come on, just worship him for a second. We exalt you, Father. Father, we exalt you above all the earth. Father, I know that one day you are going to show up and you're going to exalt Jesus above all things and everything. But, Father, in the meantime, we exalt him in our lives right now today father and that same power that you're going to do it at the end of the age where you're setting up your kingdom is the same power that you would do for us father to rule and reign in every area of our life so father i thank you that that revelation god not only of what is to come but what is now will become real inside of their hearts and father we thank you and praise you for it in jesus name amen so let's go to psalms chapter 2 how dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. You know, I love how God starts that off. Because, you know, sometimes we can listen to the news or we can listen to other people and we start getting in fear that the enemy's winning. Come on, or we even look at our own life and our own family and we think, oh, the enemy's winning. Their plots are gaining forever. Their things are going to happen. But we can read the very first sentence and say their foolish plots are futile. We got to have that idea inside of us every time the enemy attacks. Look at how the power brokers of the world rise up and hold their summit as the rulers scheme and confer together against Yahweh and his anointed king, saying, let's come together and break away from the creator. Once and for all, let's cast off these controlling chains of God and his Christ. God enthroned merrily laughs at them. The sovereign one mocks their madness. Then with the fierceness of his fiery anger, he settles the issue and terrifies them to death with these words. I myself have poured out my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will reveal the eternal purpose of God, for he has decreed over me, you are my favored son. And as your father, I have crowned you as my king eternal. Today I became your father. Ask me to give you the nations, and I will do it, and they shall become your legacy. Your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth, and you will shepherd them with unlimited authority, crushing their rebellion as an iron rod smashes jars of clay. Listen to me, all you rebel kings and all you upstart judges of the earth. Learn your lesson while there's still time. Serve and worship the awe-inspiring God. Recognize his greatness and bow before him, trembling with reverence in his presence. Fall face down before him and kiss the, kiss the sun before his anger is roused against you. Remember that his wrath can be kin quickly kindled, but many blessings are waiting for all who turn aside to hide themselves in him. I love that we're going to look at verse 4 today. At God's reaction to man's rebellion. God's reaction to man's plans to overthrow him. God's reaction to man's attempts to de denounce who he is, to diminish his power, diminish his authority. And when I read verse 4, it says God merely laughs at them. When I read that, something leaped inside of me. And every time the enemy plans something against you, your first response ought to be laughter. Come on. The first time the enemy hits you with a symptom, your first response ought to be laughter. Not fear, laughter at his plan to put sickness upon you. His plan to throw you off course. 
His plan to get you discouraged. You ought to be just like God, not get in a tizzy, not get upset, not get worried, but merely laugh at him and his futile attempts to get you to turn your back on God. We've got to learn to be just like that. And you know, I think about when I read that about how God mocks at their rebellion and he laughs because he knows who he is. Come on. He knows his power. He knows his authority. I think about, you know, Kippy's Uncle John a little bit because, you know, growing up, I've heard all these legend stories about Kippy's uncle and about the, him being a tough man and being in these tough man contests. And one day I was at the hospital working and somebody saw my name tag. And this time it wasn't about Kempy. Usually they look at me and go, please tell me you didn't. And I'm like, sir? He said, please tell me you didn't do it. I said, didn't do what? He said, please tell me you didn't marry Carl Wobble. I said, yes, sir, I did. For those that didn't know, that is his real first name. And um, I said, why, why are you asking me that? He said, well, let's just put it this way. I was his ROTC instructor at BC. And we had our share of differences. He said, Carl was a free spirit. So I went home and asked Kempy, and he busted out laughing when I mentioned the man's name. But this time it wasn't about that. He asked me if I was any kin to John Womble, and I said, yes, sir, that's my, my husband's uncle. And he said, well, let me tell you about John. And I don't know, but back then, I don't know what year it was, they had these tough man contests. And they'd set up boxing rings in the parks, and they would have tough men, they would have battle it out and duke it out, or, or have fighting in the middle of it, and Kempy's uncle always won. Well, one day they decided to bring a gorilla in. This is a true story, not a made-up story. And so they were getting ready to fight, and they brought this gorilla, and Kempy's uncle gets, stands up to fight the gorilla, walks into the ring, throws a punch, and knocks the gorilla out. Every man after that to fight Kempy's uncle took his gloves off and walked away. Now, normally you wouldn't think anybody punching a, the, a gorilla would even win a fight. But folks, that's the same thing the enemy does to you. He comes in there roaring, come on, beating his chest, thinking he's going to win this battle, and you walk in and go, in the name of Jesus, and he's defeated. That's how you've got to view this. You win the tough man contest every time if you stand firm and throw the punch. But you've got to throw it. You can't win any other way. And then I watch my kids come over every week and we have dinner together. And if you watch the little ones, I mean, Wyatt's favorite thing is to fight Papa. He's three years old, weighs nothing, okay? He's a little, Noah, my eight-month-old, weighs almost as much as my three-year-old grandson. So Wyatt has nothing behind him. He has no weight behind him. He has no strength behind that punch. But he loves to jump on Papa and just throw those punches and thinks he's going to win. And you know what? That's how the enemy is with us. He keeps throwing those punches, but no matter how much force he puts behind it, it shouldn't put a, hit me in hard enough to knock me down. It shouldn't matter why it can wail away on Papa's stomach, but it doesn't put any force behind it. Come on. It doesn't win, and that's the same thing we are. No matter how strong they are, it's not going to work. And we've got to have that same view of what the enemy throws at us. No matter how hard he swings, no matter how much he puts behind it, it will have no effect on me. Come on, that's how you've got to view this thing. The Bible says that, that their rules against what God wants to do, it will not have any power against the omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful God. Why do we think God can't handle this? You know, that's how I view it when, think, when the enemy throws some things at me. Do you think God is surprised by anything the enemy wants to do to me? No. And he's already provided me the answer. So if God's not concerned, come on. He still sits. He doesn't even get up. He just sits and laughs at them. Why should I get all in a fervor over anything? I need to keep peace. Their rages and their forces and their plans are all in vain. And God, but here's the thing. God don't just sit there and take it. There's going to come a day when God is going to speak. Amen. And when God speaks, they are going to tremble in fear. Amen. He responds with laughter. You know why God's laughing? He's laughing at their pride. He's laughing at the fact that they believe that their plans could somehow outmaneuver God. He laughs at their rebellion to think that they're somehow going to win this battle. Look at Psalms 37, verse 12. 
He said, let the wicked keep plotting against the godly with all their snares and their arrogant jeers. God doesn't lose any sleep over them. He knows their day is coming. Folks, you ought to be able to put your head on that pillow and go to sleep and just say, enemy, I know your day is coming. You will not have victory over me. You will not win in this battle. You will not even have, you know, I love to think about it, always think about it in wars and the big thing, that the war, he's not going to win the war because he's already been defeated, but I don't even want him to win a battle. And my attitude determines whether he wins the battle or not. Come on. Not what he gets to do. Not, not any of that, but with what my attitude is. Does my attitude change? Do I get angry? Come on, that, then he wins the battle if I get angry. If I get in fear, he wins the battle. If I get into bitterness, he rules, he wins the battle. If I get into hatred, he wins the battle. And I don't know about you, but I don't want the enemy to ever win a battle when it comes to my life. I want to see him defeated every single time. Psalms 59, 8. He said, but you, Lord, break out laughing at their plans, amused by their arrogance, scoffing at their sinful ways. This has got to be your response every time the enemy raises his ugly head against you. I want you to sit there and go, ha, ha, ha. You really think you're going to get me to bite that? I'm not biting that apple. I'm not biting that thing. I'm not having fear in my life. Come on. You've got to get just as bold. You've got to laugh at him. Say, you're not going to get me to doubt God. You're not going to get me in fear. You're not going to make my faith waver. You're not going to make me believe that symptom. I cast that thought down. I cast that imagination down. I'm not going to have that in my life. And if you think you're going to get me to hate, if you think you're going to get me to talk bad, devil, you've lost that battle. It's not coming into my life. You got to have the same attitude that God has. And you know, we usually talk about laughing from a steer, a, a pure joy standpoint. Yet even then, he, I love this because he laughs at the enemy whenever he thinks he's going to get me to give up, back down, cower, or be in fear. And he's not going to win. Amen. Come on. Every time I think about it, I love that image that my mom put in my head years and years ago. That if every time I back down, come on, every time I cower in fear, every time I hide my head in a blanket, come on, every time I keep my mouth shut against the wickedness of the enemy, every time I don't stand for truth, guess what? The devil's throwing a party. And I don't want him throwing a party on my behalf. He could throw it on somebody else's, but he's not going to sit over there. I actually visualize the enemy over there dancing, come on. Doing a little jig going, oh, I got her now. Look at her. Woo, that little root of bitterness just went in. If I could just feed that a little bit more, I'll feed some more lies to her. I'll feed some more untruth to her. I'll tell her about this. I'll tell her about that. And I'll watch that root of bitterness grow. And he's over there dancing. I want to be able to sit there and go, ha, yo, that stuff ain't staying in me. No way are you going to put that thought into my life. I cast that thought down in the name of Jesus. There's nothing but love and power and authority ruling and reigning in my life, and you're not going to win. Listen, you've got to talk to him out loud. The devil can't read your thoughts, but he can hear it. And you better say it with power. You better say it with authority because you've got to remember who you are in him. See, I think God wants you to understand who you are. When I'm standing up there talking to the enemy, I'm not standing there as Lisa. I'm standing there. Come on, when he sees me, he sees nothing but a child of God. He sees the Spirit of God on the inside of me that has given me power, given me authority, and given me the ability to rule and reign in every area of my life. And that's what the enemy sees when he looks at you. I love to think about that. If you, I know we have a hard time thinking of God laughing at people's tragedy, but it's important to understand why he's laughing. We in the faith movement have painted such a vivid picture of all the goodness of God that we forget about the wrath of God. And you can't have one without the other. They coincide together, and his wrath is done out of his love. And we've got to be able to see what he's doing and why he's doing it. He laughs to mock his enemies' plans and their belief that they could actually pose a threat to him and what he wants to do. It's a holy laughter in the face of the enemy thinking that he could actually defeat him. 
It's a laugh of triumph, come on, of supreme power in the middle of those who think they have authority but have none. That's what he's laughing at. Satan is already engaged in everything at his disposal. The media, the military, the legislation, public opinion, come on. This, this narrative that Christianity equals hate. This narrative that God is a limitless God who doesn't want you to be happy, who doesn't want the best for you. This idea that if you believe in the God of the Christian Bible, if you believe in the God that we preach about, if you believe in this all supreme God that says there's only one way to him, the narrow way to him, that if somehow you believe in that, you've been put into bondage and you've been full of hate. That's what he's trying to get you to buy. You know, I love it because that's the first thing they want to say is because I disagree with a lifestyle that automatically hates you. I disagree with a lifestyle that the enemy has you in bondage. I'm talking about any sin. Any, any time that you don't know Jesus, you're in bondage. Any time you don't have a relationship with God Almighty, you're in bondage to sin. And sin, the Bible says, leads to death. It leads to destruction. The Bible says sin is only pleasurable for a season and then death comes. I want to pull everybody in that, out of that. I love that. See, I'm, when, when I become born again, I no longer have that sin nature. Sin no longer rules and reigns in my life. The penalty and the, po the, the, the payment of sins already been paid for me by Jesus Christ. And I get a brand new nature. Come on. That I'm not in bondage any longer, but for once I am truly set fee free. They want this narrative that the Jesus of the Bible is either just a good man or he's a prophet or it's a myth. But he's real. And the thing about it is, I have such a relationship with him, there's no way you can convince me he's not real. That's why in our children's church and in our nurseries that we teach them how to have a relationship with Jesus. Because at that young age, Tuesday night in prayer... We have some kids that have been here ever since they were little. And Pastor Datha has taken them by the hand. And they, she walks with them. And she'll stop and she'll talk to them and say, now, now let's worship God. Let's tell God how much we love them. And they've been doing this for years. And Tuesday night, I watched one of the older ones take a younger one by the hand. And she walked around with her. And every once in a while, she'd stop and look at her and tell her how to worship Jesus. And now it's time to tell Jesus how much we love him. One, I don't know if she's five or six, telling a three-year-old. You tell me that those kids that are raised up in prayer, that are raised up in knowing that they too can talk to God and have a relationship with Him, you're not going to be able to convince them that He's not real. Because there's an intimate relationship with them. But this is how we've got to be. And I love this. How does God respond to all of this? He sits in the heavens and laughs. He doesn't even bother to stand up. That's how futile their attempts are. I love that. Despite all the collective fervor of the leaders, despite their conspiracy, God doesn't even stand to acknowledge it. Despite their rhetoric, despite their talking points, despite, despite their spin on the gospel of Jesus Christ, he doesn't even stand to acknowledge it. Matthew Henry commentary said it this way, Sometimes God is said to awake and arise and stir himself for the vanquishing of his enemies. Here he is said to sit still and vanquish them. For the utmost operations of God's omnipotence create no difficulty at all, nor the least disturbance to his eternal rest. Do you know God is not even uneasy about what's happening in the world today he don't even have to stand up to speak against what the enemy's doing so why are we in a fear why are we in a tizzy why are we all concerned about what's happening in the world if God's not even concerned enough to stand we got to have confidence in who he is he's not worried because Jesus has already won, Satan has already been defeated. The problem is we don't understand that and know it with assurance on the inside of us. So the enemy is throwing out everything he can because he knows his time is short. And he's trying to get us to buy it in. 
This is a time of purification in the church so that we're going to be prepared as a bride for Jesus. He said he's coming back for a church that's without spot or wrinkle. That means, folks, we got to have our act together. Come on, we can't be wounded and blind on the Jericho Road. Come on, we got to be put together, well-equipped, bold with the, with the power of God, bold in the power of God, bold with the Word of God to know truth and stand for truth and be bold enough to speak truth and to set people free. That's what he's coming back for. A church that's not going to waver with the culture of time. That's not going to waver with a new revelation about God. That's not going to waver. Not going to be so full of grace over here that we can't talk about sin. But not be so legalistic over here that we don't talk about grace. We got to have them both. Because I don't know where I'd be without the grace of God. Come on. None of us would be there. We've got to love, we've got to know that. Amen. It's not time to coast. God has not lost control. Come on. He knows exactly what's happening. He's got it all planned out. And he knows exactly when he's going to speak. Right. Come on. I love that God not only laughs, but he begins to respond. Verse 4 says, he terrifies them to death with these world, words. One re- translation said he ridicules them. And the New King James says, the Lord shall hold them in derision. Now, what does that mean? It means he uses ridicule and scorn to show his contempt at what they're doing. He makes them an object of ridicule. He makes them an object of scorn. Not us. See, somehow we've bought this thing that we're going to be the ridiculed ones. We're going to be the ones in scorn. We're going to be the ones that are going to be high in their head. But no, God's going to stand up and speak, and they're going to be the ones that are going to be ridiculed. They're going to be the ones that are going to hold their head down, not us. But both of these things are terrified when you think of God standing up and speaking against what you've been doing. I don't know about you, but I don't want him doing that with me. I can't imagine how, how that would be. One preacher said, this is the most terrifying laugh of history. It is God saying, do you seriously think you can overpower my authority just because you have billions of people working together? Or because you have the largest coalition of armies with more money and support than any other leader of history? Do you think you will be successful against me? Look at Isaiah chapter 40. No, verse 15, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. All of the wood in Lebanon's forest and all of Lebanon's animals would be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes, they count for less than nothing, more emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Listen, God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. His heart is that they're going to turn to him. That's his grace. That's his mercy. And we don't need to pay for their, pray for their destruction, but we pay for the, pray for the destruction of their plans, that their plans will not come. We have to pray that they have an encounter with God himself so that they can turn. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. He said, do you think I like to see wicked people die, says the sovereign Lord? Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? God's not laughing because he doesn't care about them. He's laughing that the enemy thinks he's going to win. That's what he's laughing at. He's not laughing at an individual. He's laughing at the devil. He's laughing at the enemy. But God says he longs for them to turn to them. God has absolutely nothing to prove. He validates his authority just by his mere existence. But all of this is done with one motive, and that's love. That's what we've got to understand. His judgments are to remove whatever hinders love. He will do whatever it takes for his love for us to be unobstructed and to fill the earth. What obstructs the love of God? Rebellion. So many times people in the church says, I, you know, I've been talking to somebody and they said, I don't feel the love like I used to. I don't feel 
the passion for Jesus that I used to feel. I don't feel that. And I said, rebellion is what keeps you from feeling that. That's why we do the life classes, because it removes every hindrance to feeling the love of God that you have. It sets you free to understand all of it. But God judges to remove sin and rebellion from the earth. This earth was created for us. We turned it over to Satan in our sin. But he's going to come back and he's going to wipe all rebellion from the face of the earth. He's going to set up his kingdom on this earth. If the Bible says that he's going to have an earthly throne and a heavenly throne. And he's coming to wipe all traces of hindrance out of the way. All traces of rebellion out of the way. To set up his earthly kingdom once and for all. And that's what he's going to do. He longs for you to enjoy him and to share in his being. But it's hard for us to talk about the wrath of God, but it doesn't change it. It's still there. And you have to talk about it. We love to focus on the love of God, His kindness and His grace and His mercy that's everlasting. And none of those are not true, but none of those take away from His wrath at the same time. I can remember years ago, Mom preached a message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, and people got angry with her. But folks, He has a side of, love has a side of righteous anger. Against sin and rebellion and the plans that the enemy has. Because God knows that that sin and that rebellion keeps you from having that intimate relationship with him. And given all that God has for you. And he knows it's a blocking and a hindrance. And you're not going to experience everything that he has. And all that he wants to do in your life as long as sin and rebellion remain. But once you get free, come on, once you get rid of all that, there's an open heaven for the love and the mercy and the grace of God to saturate you like never before. The windows of heaven are opened up over you. That's what he wants in your life. God has not changed and he will not change. His judgments are just and they are true and they're fair and they line up with his love and they line up with his mercy and they line up with his grace. It's all, all packaged. That's the way he does. God's plan for us is to crown us with his glory. Look at Hebrews 2, 7. He said, you made him lower than the angels for a little while. You placed your glory and honor upon his head as a crown. And you've given him dominion over the works of your hand. His desire is for you to be, have the glory of God all over you. To shine wherever you go. To carry that glory to set other people free. What does that mean? It's holiness. Love, righteousness, and power, yet we have continuously chosen sin over him, which prevents us from enjoying this glory. And that's what he wants. Because sin cannot coexist with his holiness. They just can't. He can't overlook it because his pain paid for it. He paid to remove it. He went to the, Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. God, that pain, that sin, the penalty of sin had to be dealt with justly and it had to be dealt with fair. And God loved you so much that he sacrificed his only son to pay the price for you so you wouldn't have to pay it. You could only accept it and you could walk in all that God has for you. That's a loving God. But he, the, the penalty of sin had to be paid for justly and fairly. And that's why Jesus did it for you. And that's why it could be given to you for free. It's a wrath against rebellion, and yet it never contradicts love. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. And there is still much more to say of this unfailing love for us. For though the blood of Jesus... Through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration. You are not righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. Woo, glory. J.I. Packer, who's a, who's a biblical scholar, says it this way. God's wrath in the Bible is never capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, or morally ignoble thing that, that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and a necessary reaction to objective moral evil. See, it's not you God's mad at. It's evil that he's mad at. It's sin that he's mad at. What is going to happen to them in the last days? God said he's going to terrify them to death. He is going to shake the nation's rule. 
They bring affliction upon themselves as a nation because of their rebellion against God. Kind of like Pharaoh did in the Bible. The sin, that, the things that happened to them, the, the locusts and the boils and all that stuff that happened on the earth was their reaction, their rebellion against God opened up for the enemy to do that to them. And this is, I love this. They bring it upon themselves. and I, God uses his people as his mouthpiece. We are the mouthpiece of God on this earth. That's why he wants you to speak truth. He wants you to speak freedom. And he wants you to speak whatever he tells you to say in that time. Who are these people? It's us. And he's going to use you to speak to nations. Let's look at Paul in um, 1 Corinthians. Paul comes back to the Corinthian church and he's discouraged. And Paul's discouraged because he went to Athens and he thought that his intellect and his knowledge would be able to convince the, uh, the church in Athens that or the people in Athens that they needed God. And Paul comes back because his flowery words and his, his great communication skills and his knowledge of the things of the world could not get them to turn to Jesus. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is what Paul says. To preach the message of the cross seems like sheer nonsense to those who were on their way to destruction. But to us who are on our way to salvation, it is the mighty power of God released in us. And verse 22 said, For in his wisdom, God designed that all the world's wisdom would be insufficient to lead people to the discovery of himself. He took great delight in baffling the wisdom of the world by using the simplicity of preaching the story of the cross in order to save those who believe in it. For the Jews constantly demanded to see miraculous signs with those who are not Jews, Constantly cling to the world's wisdom. So the Jews wanted to see signs and wonders, and the Greeks wanted to see their wisdom. But, say but, but. we preach the crucified Messiah. The Jews stumble over him, and the rest of the world sees him as foolish. But for those who have been chosen to follow him, both Jews and Greeks, he is God's mighty power, God's true wisdom, and our Messiah. So in other words, your flattery words, your all your wisdom, your great communication skills, your ability to argue with the finest is not going to win them to Jesus. But the simplicity of the cross, come on, the simplicity of his love for dying for you on a cross is what's going to win them. I had a young man come to me and he said, you know, I, I'm enjoying being away. He said, my, 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 my religion, he said, is, is not exactly like my parents, but that's okay because I love all the intellectual stuff. And I said, that's really sad. And he was shocked that I said it to him. And he said, why, why is that sad? I love the way they explain it and the intellect behind it. I said, son, you can put as many big words as you want to when you're talking about Jesus and the cross. But the gospel is a very simple message. And there's no reason to complicate it. There's no reason to use big words. All you need to do is share the love of Jesus and his sacrifice and what he did and what God gave up for us. And all of that is what's going to win people to Jesus. It's the love and the compassion and the simplicity that Jesus loved you enough to give his life for you. Amen. And pay the penalty of sin so you don't have to. We don't need to complicate it. We need to live it. Live it in front of them. Show them God's love everywhere, every time you turn around. Have compassion and mercy. You know, you, what, what I've done with, with, in my life growing up in the church is that when I have difficult people, you know, I can remember growing up and they said, every time you look at somebody that's, that's difficult to love, just picture the blood of Jesus covering them. And you ought to be able to see everybody through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because most of the time, people who are angry, people who are bitter, people who have that nasty attitude that nobody wants, they're hurting people who need a touch from God Almighty. And what better way to transform somebody's life than introduce them to Jesus? The question is whether you're going to be faithful to his call. Are you going to be a faithful witness of his word? Proclaiming the truth is not for the preacher or the prophet. It's all for the, each one of us. Bonhoeffer in his book the called the cost of discipleship he said this when Jesus Christ crucified is not proclaimed and lived out in love the church is bored and boring society there's no power no challenge no fire no change we make drab what ought to be dramatic a Christian is a lover of Christ and his cross Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 2 for I resolve to know nothing 
except Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, don't, don't come to me with how, how your great knowledge of the word of God. Don't come to me with all your little things that you can prove and not prove. Show me the love of Jesus. Show me the love of the cross. Show me the love of a God who redeemed me and set me free. Paul said, that's what I know. Nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In a city where sexual morality flourished, Paul abandoned his wisdom and he preached instead the cross of Jesus. That's what's going to get people. That's what's going to win people. See, when they come to church on a Sunday morning and they see every ethnic group ever possible, not only we're serving God together, not only worshiping the King of Kings, but living life together in love, that's what's going to get people. That's what's going to win people to Jesus Christ. Not our flattery words, not our programs, not our overhead. None of that's going to get it. But the love of Jesus is the only thing that's going to get it. And the problem is in the church, we've been either trying to be popular or we've tried to be politically correct or we've gone to the other extreme. You can't preach, come on, of his love and his wrath in the same sentence as what they think. But you can because they go together. It's either all love, all grace, all mercy without any of wrath, or either it's all wrath and without any love, grace, and mercy. But folks, the true gospel is the road that's in between, that has the love and the grace and the mercy and the wrath at the same time. Because God cannot stand where sin is. He just can't. It's impossible for him because of his love for us. The divide's going to get wider. But if we hope to be faithful in God's call, we've got to speak the difficult and offensive things of the gospel just as much as we do the popular ones. Our effectiveness is in our ability to be against the world, yet still for it. We can stand against the moral wickedness of our culture and yet still walk in love and lead people to the hope found in God. I love it. One pastor said it this way. We need to be world affirming and world denying at the same time. You've got to be. Matthew 24, 13 said, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Those who are faithful will accept this call to speak forth no matter what the cost. And I love it. What did God say to them that terrified them so? Verse 6 says, I myself have poured out my king on Zion, my holy mountain. What is God's response to evil? To exalt Jesus Christ. That's what it is. That's why we're singing that song. Every time you're in the face of evil, you exalt Jesus as king and as Lord. And every time you exalt Jesus, every power and every force from heaven comes to back you up and defeat the enemy. It's Jesus and him exalted that wins. And that's what you do in your life now. And I love it, but see, even his baptism and his transfiguration, the, the, the heavens opened up and God said, this is my son, I'm well pleased. And he acknowledged who he was. But this time, it's going to be different than every other time. This time when God speaks, this time when he exalts his son, it's going to be an inauguration ceremony. It's the time he is setting up him as king of kings and lord of lords forever on this earth. That's what the difference is going to be. And when they see Jesus in clo clothed in his majesty, clothed in his glory, declared and appointed by God, they will tremble. Amen. Psalms 110 verse 5 describes the scene. He said, the Lord stands in full authority to shatter to pieces the kings who stand against you on the day he displays his terrible wrath. He will judge every rebellious nation, filling their battlefield with corpses, and will shatter the strongholds of ruling powers. There's coming a day that Jesus is going to come back and declare and take back the city of Jerusalem and set up his rule and reign. Luke 1, says, He will be supreme and will be known as the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Hallelujah! Glory to God! So my challenge to you today, are you going to be the one that remains faithful to the end? Are you going to get rid of any rebellion, any strife, any anger, any hatred, anything inside of you that's going to stop what God's going to do in your life? Get up and rise to your feet. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Father. Glory to you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We worship you. Come on, just worship him right now. Magnify your name. Father, we thank you. There is no one like you, Lord. No one like you. Lord, we, can you just do, be.